You may be seated, and as you are seated, take your Bible and turn to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Today we start a new series that's going to last all summer long in the Experiencing God, um, where on Sundays we're going to come and I'll kind of introduce what we're going to talk about in our workbooks through the week. And I hope that you've bought a study guide, a study book, as, as uh, we've been announcing it the last several weeks. If you haven't, go to Amazon and buy a, uh, a study book for experiencing God and then jump in with us as soon as, as soon as you can. Otherwise, you're going to start tomorrow with working through um, this, this series. Next Sunday, I um, will not be with you because I'll be in Cincinnati, Ohio with uh, the Romaine family. And Lord willing, Ian is going to be baptized in the church that they're attending up there in Cincinnati. And I'm excited to be able to be there um, for that. Camp staff, we're really, really glad you're here. Uh, I can't begin to tell you how glad. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> and uh, typically the first week of the staff members are there. I'm out there with them at some point during the week just to share a little bit. And I get to do that this week. So I'll see you maybe on, on Tuesday, I think it is. Uh, Jefferson and Heidi Tadowski. Jefferson, you are here. Heidi is not because y'all just had a baby. Um, church, can we congratulate the Tadowski family on the birth of Liam? <clears throat> Really glad you're here, and I understand why Heidi's not here today. But congratulations, Jeff and Heidi. You know, as we've been talking about, it's kind of come up already a couple of times in, in the service today. There are things in this world that are not as they're supposed to be. In fact, they're, they're, they're not as God created them to be. The very beginning of creation, God works through creation the first six days. He, he, he looks at his creation every single day, and he, he says that it is good. He gets to the last day of creation, and, it, he, and he says that creation is very good. In other words, it is perfect. Nothing is wrong with his creation. But we know that not long after that, something happened that brought sin into the world, and then what was perfect is tainted by sin. So that is what causes death. That's what causes sickness. That's what causes heartache that we have here in, in this world. Now, as a Christian, the difficulty that we see taking place around us can have one of two effects on us. The first effect that it can have is, is very simply that it fills us with despair and it pushes us away from God. We see the heartache happening, and we're filled with heartache ourselves and despair, and so we say, God, I'm gonna run away from you because how can you allow this to happen? The other response, and there's only two responses, it can only be two, you cannot stay static, okay? It's either you're running away from God or you're running to God, and that's that second response. When we see the, the, the heartache around us, it fills us with a longing for more of God. God, I want more of your goodness. I want more of you. I want more of who you are. I want to know you more. Only two responses we can have, run away from God or run to God. And I really believe that in this study that we're beginning today, and, and really we're going to spend the whole summer working through the same idea, I really believe that we are in need of a fresh reminder of what it means to experience God to then come to truly know God. And what I want to do today is just spend a few moments walking through a few thoughts that are, that are prevalent thoughts that we'll see come up over and over again throughout our study. Um, these are introductory thoughts. It's not like um, I'm, I'm giving you a whole lot of what you're going to study this week. It's just I'm, I'm helping direct us a little bit here, okay? This is not a heavy exegetical sermon either, so don't expect that as we run into it. But I want to, to direct our thoughts to what does it mean to experience God? And that's what we're going to start with today. Before we really get to talking about experiencing God, though, I believe it's very important for, for me to make this point. The Bible is God-centered. The Bible is God-centered. Now, on the back of your handout today, you can fill in the blank notes as we go through this. So if you'll, if you'll fill that in, the Bible is God-centered. Every single time we open up this book, every single time we open up this book, we find the character and the nature and the plan of God. We find the story of God. We find the will of God. We find God's agenda. What is God up to? All of the Bible is God-centered. I think about 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, where we find that all Scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. That the man of God, here's the goal, the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 
That's the goal of us being immersed in God's Word. It's that we become Christians who honor God with our lives and who live out His will for us in this world. So whatever His will is, we go live it out based on what we find as we immerse ourselves in God's Word. Now, when we open up the Bible to read, the Holy Spirit is our teacher. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. He illuminates God's Word in such a way that helps our minds comprehend what God is saying. It's almost like a a flashlight, a light that comes down all of a sudden to illuminate, help us understand what God is saying here in His Word. I can't tell you how many times um, I have been reading the Bible and something will pop out that I've never understood before. And it's almost like all of a sudden I've got an understanding of God and I've got an understanding of his word that I never, ever had before. And that's the Holy Spirit working. That's the Holy Spirit showing me not only what God's word says, but what it means and how it applies to my life. That's why oftentimes when I pray at the beginning of a sermon, I pray, God, don't just show us what your word says. Show us what it means and then how it applies to our lives. And we use the teaching of God's word um, through human teachers to help us understand God's Word. And that's how the Holy Spirit works. He uses teachers like myself. And I I hope and I pray that when when I teach God's Word that you're understanding God's Word a little bit better. That's how the Holy Spirit works. So we take this idea that that the Bible, first of all, is God-centered, and that secondly, the Holy Spirit is our teacher, and that sometimes the Holy Spirit uses human teachers And this is where a study such as the Experiencing God study comes into the picture. We use the teaching of this study on the Word of God to mold and shape us into more gospel-centered, biblically literate Christians. Now, as you approach this series, I hope that you do so wanting to be a better Christian, one who wants to know and do the will of God, a Christian who wants to know God and know His Word more deeply. Henry Blackaby, in talking about the, um, the Experiencing God study as a whole, he's, a, he's the author of the Experiencing God study. He tells how there were people who were convinced that he should have called the this, this study knowing God instead of experiencing God. But he goes back to the Old Testament to show the way the Hebrews interacted with God to show that knowing God and experiencing God are two different things. You see, the Hebrews were invited to experience and subsequently know God over and over and over again. Um, God continually reveals himself to them. You see his presence found in the Holy of Holies. Um, You see him working miracle after miracle and, and God leading and guiding, and he allowed the people to experience him. In fact, God was continually inviting the people to experience him. In the New Testament age, after Jesus Christ, the Christian has the presence of God It doesn't reside in the Holy of Holies anymore. The the presence of God resides in us as Christians. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We have the indwelled Holy Spirit living inside of us. And thus, we have a continuous invitation to experience God. You can know about God without experiencing God. But listen, you cannot experience God without it inevitably leading to you knowing God. I'm going to say that one more time so we make sure we're on the same page, okay? You can know about God, things about God, facts about God without ever experiencing God. But when you experience God, it will inevitably lead to you better knowing God. Does that make sense? So the goal this summer is that we learn how do I experience God so that I can better know God. And what Blackaby argues is that we got a whole lot of Christians who think that they know a lot about God, but they don't know how to experience God. And I would agree with that, just from my life. I feel like a lot of times I know the facts. But man, I forget how to experience the greatness and the goodness of my God. I forget like Pastor Dwayne was talking about, I forget these names of God and how they show me who God is and how to have a personal encounter and relationship with God. And it feels in me, just as I stand here now, a longing, God, I want to know you more. So God, I need your help in experiencing you. So what we're going to talk about in this series as we go through this is that we're going to seek to understand experiencing God 
so that we can better know God. We're going to hitch our proverbial wagon to Scripture and allow Scripture to be our guide to experiencing God. That's the first thing I really want to make sure that you understood today is that we are using Scripture, God-centered Scripture, as our guide to experiencing God. Secondly, predominantly the question that I hear over and over and again is, is this, what is the will of God? How many of you at some point in your life have asked that question? God, what is your will? And if you're not raising your hand right now, then something, maybe not being completely honest, okay? We all wonder, what is the will of God? In fact, people, when they come to me, the the normal question they ask is, uh, Pastor, how do I know God's will for my life, for my school, for my vocation, for my family, for my relationships, whatever it is, how do I know God's will for my life? Henry Blackaby says, I believe that there is a DNA in all believers that makes them want to know and do the will of God. I agree with that. Because think about this. Think about this for a moment. Why would a Christian have become a Christian if they didn't want to know and do the will of God? If a person has a true and genuine intention when it comes to their faith, they're going to want to follow God. The whole first week of our series that you're going to jump into tomorrow is, is, is talking about God's will and your life. And you're going to first look at how God's will is for you to come to know Jesus in a personal way. The whole point of Jesus coming to earth is so that he could die the death that I deserve to die for my sin. And God's will, his big picture will, is that none should perish. In other words, none should spend eternity apart from God, apart from salvation, but that all should come to repentance and all should know God. We know that God's will is that all men place their faith and trust in Jesus as their Savior. But then what this study is going to do as we move through the week is it's going to start to break down this idea of knowing and doing the will of God in our daily lives. So this question of of what is the will of God is what we're going to work to answer this week. If you really think about it, the question of what is the will of God is really not so hard a question as we often make it out to be. And I would argue, and this is where John chapter 5 comes in, I would argue that the pattern for knowing and doing the will of God is found in Jesus. The pattern that we can put our lives up against to say, how do I know and do the will of God is found in Jesus. You're in John chapter 5. We'll be there in just a moment. But if you look at the context of this whole passage, Jesus is performing miracles. He's teaching. He's carrying out the responsibilities that God has given him to do while he's here on this earth. He's carrying out the role that God's given him, his purpose. The religious leaders hate Jesus for what he's doing. In fact, um, in in John chapter 5 and verse 18, we're not going to spend any time on this, but you see that they hate him so much that they're ready to kill him for it. He's claiming to be the son of God. But not only that, he's healing people on the Sabbath. It's like a double whammy. They're ready to kill him for it. But Jesus is here, as we find in verse 17, because God is working and because he's following God in what he's doing. Look at verse 17. But Jesus answered them, in the middle of all their anger, my father is working until now, and I am working. Jesus is simply saying that God is at work carrying out his plan and that Jesus is joining God where he's working. Here's one of the things we're going to see throughout the study, and that is that God is always at work around us. God is always at work around us. There are always things that God is doing. In fact, he's never not at work. He's always working, always calling people to himself, always moving people closer in the relationship with him, always working out his plan for the salvation of mankind, the redemption of the world at large. God is always at work around us. He never sleeps. He never takes a rest. He never stops caring. He never stops working. And if I don't see God working around me, it's not because he stopped, it's because I'm blind. And it could be that my sin has blinded me, it could be apathy, it could be that I'm pursuing religion over a relationship. If I don't see God working though, it's not because of him, it's because of me. I'm blind. God is always at work. And we see here that Jesus watched to see where the Father was working, and what did he do? He joined him. Jesus watched to see where the Father was working, and he joined him. Let's pick up our reading in verse 19. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. 
For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. There's a word that Jesus uses here, and I love this word. It's the word sees. You see that? Jesus does only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. When Jesus was in human form here on earth and he was carrying out God's purpose for him here on earth, he watched to see where God was working. And when Jesus saw the Father working, he joined him in that work. Jesus wasn't marching to the beat of his own drum. He wasn't the one calling the shots. Jesus knew how important it was that he stay in tune with the Father, with the Father's will. And whatever the Father was doing, Jesus followed him in that. And one of the things that, that kind of draws my mind to, to this, one of the examples we see in Jesus, talking about this pattern, is just very simply the way that Jesus prayed constantly. You think about all the accounts that we have in the, in the New Testament, in the Gospels of Jesus, of Jesus praying. He goes to, to God in, in prayer to align his earthly life with God. We see him pray at his baptism. He, he prayed before and after healing people. He prayed before raising Lazarus from the dead. He prayed all night before choosing his disciples. He prayed at the return of the 70. He prayed before feeding the 5,000 and before he walked on water. Jesus prayed three separate prayers in Gethsemane for, before his betrayal. He prayed on the cross. He prayed a prayer of blessing after the resurrection and before the ascension. And listen, these are just a few accounts. This is just a few that I can remember off the top of my head, okay? There's many, many, many accounts of Jesus praying. And what he does in that is he connects his earthly life with his, earthly, with his heavenly father. He says, God, I want to be about your business. I want to be about your will. Not my will, he says, but yours be done. And in order for me to align myself with God, I have got to connect with God, knowing his word, spending time in prayer. I've got to experience God. Jesus aligned his schedule with the plan of God. You know, I think about this idea of a pattern, Jesus being a pattern. And for me as a Christian, when God shows me where he's working, it's an invitation to join him. When God shows me where he's working, it's an invitation to join him. Did you know that God has an agenda? He absolutely has an agenda. He's got a plan that he wants to carry out in this world, and he's got a plan that he wants to carry out through you as an individual. And just like Jesus, a Christian watches for the ways that God is working out his agenda, and then we join God where he's working. But listen, you better watch out. Because about the time that you start asking God where you can be involved in his agenda, there's a strong chance he's going to take you to places you never thought that you could go. And he's going to ask you to do things and stretch you to do things that you never thought that you could do. But there is no greater place to be than in the center of God's will, walking into territory that is unknown and that requires a level of faith that we haven't been called to before. In fact, I get so fired up about what I think God can do and, um, and how I can join him in what he's doing that sometimes people have to remind me, hey, Kevin, don't run ahead of the Lord. Slow down a little bit. Let the Lord be the one that leads. And you know, as I think about this, I think about, all right, I see the way the Lord leads. I see the way that he works. I see how he uses some people. Um, I've got the, the Billy Graham channel in the radio on my, on my truck, in my truck. And I listen to the, my boys love the Billy Graham channel. I mean, we, we get in the truck and the boys say they don't want to listen to music. They want to listen to Billy Graham preaching. And so we listen to Billy Graham preaching in my, in my truck on and on. And I think about the thousands upon thousands, no, hundreds of thousands, millions of people that that man had an opportunity to minister to. And how many people are going to be in heaven someday because of his ministry. And I think you're like, that's, a, that's an elite Christian. That's a varsity level Christian right there. That's the kind of guy that God uses. That's the kind of person that God can't help but use. But you know what I think about Amos in the book of, in the, in the Old Testament. Amos chapter 7, verses 14 through 15 Here's what, here's what we find. 
Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. In other words, I was a nobody. I was a farmer. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Amos was one of the most passionate, intense prophets in all of the Old Testament. He was dearly loved most of the time, not all the time, by people. He had a huge ministry. But where did he start? He started as a no-name farmer. And God called him out of that to go and minister. And Amos would go on to do great things for God simply because when God called, he answered with, yes, I'll go. Yes, I'll do it. And because of Amos's yes, and because Amos saw God as the master and himself as the servant, God was able to do things in and through Amos that he never would have imagined God doing. Now, Amos wasn't a spiritually elite person. He wasn't the varsity level Christian as we oftentimes consider it. He wasn't someone that had a dad that was somebody special. He was a farmer, and God used him mightily. Y'all, the servant doesn't have the agenda, the master does. The servant doesn't have the agenda, the master does. And I would add to that statement, and he, the master, can be trusted. The master can be trusted. You know, there may be times that you cannot understand for the life of you why in the world God is calling you to do something, but in the end, he is the one with the agenda and the plan. And he is the one who knows all things. And he is the one who paid the greatest price possible for our salvation. So there is no reason to not allow him to set the agenda and then we follow him. Throughout the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, there's many instances of God calling um, on his people to obey him and obey his word, and then over and over again is followed with a promise. Uh, for example, Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 28, verse 1. And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. God speaking to his people there. Here's another example, 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 3. And keep the charge of the Lord your God. In other words, obey him, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies. As it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. You know, folks, we don't obey God so that he will bless us, but we obey because we know that God has his agenda and he is worthy of being trusted. Now, right now, you may be on the front end of something that God is calling you to do, and you're looking at it going, I don't know how in the world I'm going to do this. Or maybe you're in the middle of something that God has called you to do, and you think, I'm failing miserably at this. And you look at it, and you say, God, what in the world are you doing with me? And you're filled with doubt. But can I tell you that we may not always have all the answers, and that's Okay. God is the master and he's got the agenda and our role is just simply to be a servant and follow him. Here's one more statement I'll give you before we close and that is, the question is not, what do you want me to do for you? The question is, God, what are you doing? Most Christians ask God, God, what do you want me to do for you? I think his response is something like, nothing. <laughs> I want to do something through you. It's not necessarily that I, in my strength, can do something for God. Because like we talked about before, he is Elohim. He is the creator. I can't create the heavens and the earth, but he did. And all along, he's looking at us and he's going, you know what? I will have something that I want to do through you. It's not that you can do anything for me. I want to do something through you. And it's what I want to focus on this summer, this journey that we go on this summer, is, is for us to learn to be open-handed and just say, all right, God, my hands are open and empty, and whatever you want to do, I'm going to follow you in that. God, you work your mighty plan through me. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus has been doing some incredible stuff. In fact, um, he's, he's, it, it's typical Jesus, right? 
He's doing all the typical Jesus stuff. And, and this is the response of the people. Luke 5, 26, an amazement seized them all. And they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. This is my prayer for our church. This is our, my prayer for our ministries at large. This is my prayer for each of us as individuals, that we will see God do extraordinary things in the days ahead, things that only he can receive the glory for. But what I know without a doubt is that until we are open-handed and say, God, I want to experience you, thereby knowing you, he can't do it. So we're going on this journey this, this summer to experience God. Let's pray. Father, we know without a doubt that um, you have proven yourself over and over and over and over again to be a faithful God who has the ability to redeem people. You have the ability, Father, to, to carry out your agenda. And Father, for some reason, you choose to use us as fallible, weak human beings. And, and, the, and the dichotomy of this whole thing is that the more weak and open-handed we are, bringing nothing to the table except ourselves, the more you can do through us. Father, help us to know and do your will. Help us to learn more about you so that you can receive the glory and the honor that you alone are due. And Father, may we give you praise and glory for what you do in us and through us in the days ahead. Father, we love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.